COVID virus. The elders have met and we have decided to begin a mask required service for Sunday mornings in the fellowship room and a mask encouraged service in the auditorium beginning this Sunday, November the 15th. The mask required service will have live streaming for the whole service. This will allow everyone to hear and participate together in the same service. All classes will begin this Sunday also. There will be a mask required service, I mean a mask required class in the fellowship hall following the worship service down there. All other classes are strongly encouraged to wear their masks also. We ask that if you cannot social distance while visiting and fellowshipping, that you wear a mask for the safety of yourself and others around you. We will also have a mask required service on Sunday night and Wednesday night in the fellowship room. These services will also be live streamed so everyone can participate in the same service together. The mask encouraged service will be in the auditorium for both Sunday night and Wednesday night. All children's classes for Sunday morning and Wednesday night will also begin this Sunday. We are starting these classes in the hope that everyone will feel comfortable and be able to attend all the services. Please pray for the elders to be able to make wise decisions as we move forward with this pandemic. Let's have a prayer as we open our service. Our most gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day that you've given us and for this evening that we can come together and worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we just pray that you will give the elders the wisdom and, and uh, the knowledge that they need to be able to make wise decisions that will be better for this congregation to be able to worship you. Father, we pray for the safety of each one of our members, and we just pray that, that each one can worship you and feel safe in the environment that they are in. Father, we pray that you will help, to help the, the doctors and the scientists and the ones that are working to find a cure for this, this virus that they might do so quickly and that this pandemic may end quickly. Father, we pray that you'll be with this country be with the leaders of this country, and, and we just pray that the turmoil and the strife will come to an end, and that, that we can live in peace and harmony and love once again. Father, help us to be able to encourage and reach out to each other, encourage and edify one another. Help us to uplift each other. Father, we just pray that we can worship you tonight in spirit and truth and sing praises unto you and hear your word spoken to us that will help to us to be better Christians. Father, forgive us whenever we fall, forgive us whenever we sin against you, and help us to be able to get back onto the straight and narrow path. Father, we love you so much, and we thank you for allowing us to come and worship you tonight. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. First song is number 738. Afterwards, F.H. Gates will have our scripture reading. We'll sing just the first verse, 738. We will glorify the King of kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. Our Bible reading will be from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. We'll be reading from the New King James Version. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. And I thank Christ our Lord, who has enabled me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy 
that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long-suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God alone, who is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I'd like to say a prayer for Lynn Jordan. Uh, he's been in the hospital at least for a week and just it looks like infection is going around his heart and maybe his brain and just they're having a hard time trying to figure out the source of his infection. So let's have this prayer right now. Dear Father, we thank you that you allow us to come before you in the name of Jesus, uh, to lay before you, Father, all of our concerns and our cares, and certainly we're concerned about our brother Lynn, and you know how important he is to us, how special he is, and, and how much he and his family have, have, have suffered through this. And we just pray, Father, you give wisdom to the doctors. We pray that you give him peace and comfort while they uh, try to figure out what's going on and, and find the source of his infection so he'll be able to get well and, and get back to his normal life. And please bless all of the family, Father. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. If you'd like to mark your songbooks, the invitation song is number 337. It's 337. And before our message, let's sing number 449. James, can you check the rear projector, please? 449. Would you stand as we sing? Oh, the bitter pain and sorrow that a time could ever be when I proudly said to Jesus, all of self and none of thee, all of self and none of thee, all of self and none of thee, when I proudly said to Jesus, all of self and none of he found me, I beheld him bleeding on the cursed tree, and my wistful heart said faintly, some of self and some of it, some of self and some of it, some of self and some of it, and my wistful heart said faintly, some of self and some of thee. Day by day his tender mercy, healing, helping, full and free. From me lower while I whispered, less of self and more of thee. Less of self and more of it. Less of self and more of it. Brought me lower while I whispered. Less of self and more of it. Higher than the highest heavens, deeper than the deepest sea. Lord, thy love at last has conquered none of self and all of it. None of self and all of it. None of self and all of it. Lord, thy love at last has conquered none of self and all of them. Please be seated. Hearing a song like that is almost like saying sick him to a dog when he comes to a preacher. Way to go, Phil. My topic tonight is the Apostle Paul. And there's no way in the time allotted for this lesson we could talk about him to the extent that we really would like to and need to. But let's maybe look at a few things tonight that will help us, I think, maybe appreciate this man who 
was a bitter, bitter enemy of Christ, became one of the great stalwart preachers and apostles of all time. Paul was from Asia Minor. His birthplace, Tarsus, was a major city in the area of Cilicia, which was also in Syria. And at the time of Paul, this had become a part of the Roman province, conquered by Pompey, the very famous Roman general. And this was kind of a background for him in a way, because you see, Paul was a Roman citizen. Little is known of his family. We do know that he had a sister, that he had a nephew. Read about that in Acts 26, 13. But as you think about it, we don't know much else about them except that he was a Roman citizen. In Acts chapter 22, beginning with about verse 25, Paul was on trial in a sense before the Jewish brethren. They were going to try to tear him to pieces and kill him. The Romans rescued him, and in the course of the conversation, they were going to examine him by scourging, which meant they were going to beat him till he confessed to something, whether he did it or not. And he reminded them that he was a Roman citizen. He said, is it lawful to be a Roman and uncondemned? And that created quite a stir because they had actually bound him. Later on in the conversation, he made the observation that he was a Roman citizen. I was born a citizen, he says. And so when you look at Paul, he had a, this was important later on. When he could not get justice from Felix or Festus, Paul found it necessary to appeal to Caesar and go to Rome. And that was a right of the Roman citizens, incidentally, that they could do that. And so it was important that he be this kind of person. Until his conversion, Paul was a practicing member of the sect of the Jews, the most prominent and the most religious, really the strictest, of the Pharisees. These people were, were very strict in regard to the law itself, but as Dan pointed out last Wednesday night, they had made their traditions an oral law and compared them equally with, with the written law. And they used as a background for this or a reason for it that at Mount Sinai, Moses gave not only the Ten Commandments, but he gave an oral law. And in the book of Deuteronomy, he did the same thing. And so they said, this is, this is lawful to do this. But it wasn't really, that was a problem. Now they were students of the Hebrew Bible, but this created a problem because Jews were scattered all over the world. And over time, they had lost the ability to read the Hebrew language. They didn't have a copy of scriptures like we do. And so in addition to that, the Hebrew language as a conversational language was basically kind of waning, and the Greek became basically the language of the whole world. And so what happened was about 200 years before Christ, a group of Jewish scholars got together and they translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek. And that translation was called the Septuagint or the LXX, which is the Roman numeral for 70. And Paul had a very extensive background in his studies in this particular translation. We know that because in his letter, letter, or letters and writings, whenever he wrote, he almost always quoted from the Septuagint rather than the Hebrew Bible. So this, this gave Paul a very great background in the Greek translation, and that was important because it gave him an extensive background, and the Holy Spirit could use this as Paul would go forth and, and would be able to preach because of the Greek language. The Holy Spirit inspired Paul, just like he did everybody else that was inspired, but he used the abilities of each individual person. And so Paul was extensively, had an extensive background in the Greek translation. And he was, that served him very well in later years. Paul was well educated in all things pertaining to the Jewish law as well as the traditions of his fathers. In Acts chapter 22, verse 3, he said, I'm, in, I'm indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Philistia, who was brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law and was zealous toward God as you all are today. And then later on, when he wrote to the church at Galatia, he would put it like this. I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father. And so this idea then would give him great inspiration in his preaching. No person who would argue with Paul or try to refute his arguments was successful because Paul was able to take these Old Testament scriptures and point out exactly how they applied to Christ and how Christ was a fulfillment of them. And each one of them that, that was written was, 
was written to help them understand why Christ came and what he did when he came. And so as you look at it, this will give him a great, a great help in his preaching. One thing about Paul, anything he was into as far as religion was concerned, he was in 100%. Paul didn't have one, feet, one foot in one side and another foot in the other side. He was not a double-minded man. He was committed to everything that, that he really put himself into. He said in Philippians chapter 3, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. In Acts chapter 23, verse 1, he said, I've lived in all good conscience before God to this day. What a remarkable statement. What a remarkable man to be able to make that statement. But Paul was the po most powerful enemy of the Lord's church of his day. And nobody else hated the church as much as he did or tried to destroy it as much as he did. In Acts chapter 22, verses 4 and 5, he said, I persecuted this way to death. Standing before the Jews, both Sadducees and Pharisees, standing on the steps of the Roman citadel, he made this statement, I persecuted this way the church to death, binding and delivered into prisons both men and and women. Also the high priest bears me witness all the counsel of the elders from whom I received letters to the brethren and I went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. Acts 26 verses 9 and 10. I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem and many of the saints I shut up in prison having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Galatians chapter 1, verse 13. You've heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. Can you imagine one who hates the church so much and who tries with every fiber of his being to destroy it? Because he believed they were wrong and he believed the Jewish law was still in effect and was, was must be preserved at any cost. But little did Paul know when he left Jerusalem, headed for Damascus, his life was going to completely change. Something was going to happen to him on that road that was going to make an entirely different person out of him. His viewpoint, his worldview, his look, the way he looked at the church, it's all about to change. On the way to Damascus, he had this vision that changed his life. According to Galatians chapter 1, verse 16, he made the statement that, that God revealed his son in him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1, he said, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen the Lord? You remember that story. It's recorded for us in Acts chapter 9, and Acts chapter 22, and Acts chapter 26. In Acts 9, Luke records the facts for us. In Acts 22, Paul recounts this as he stands before his Jewish brethren. In Acts 26, he recounts this before King Agrippa. He saw this blinding great light. And a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Not the church. Why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus of Nazareth whom you're persecuting. What do you want me to do, Lord? Go into the city of Damascus and it will be told you there what you must do. So he goes blinded. Can't see. Three days and three nights without anything to eat or drink. And finally, the Lord tells Ananias to go and to give him his sight back and to baptize him. And Ananias says, I don't want to do that. This man's the enemy of the church. The Lord said, go. He is a chosen vessel. And I will show him what things he must suffer for my name's sake. And from that day on in the life of Paul, he was different. He preached differently. He did everything differently as far as his religion was concerned. And we're going to notice in just a minute the things that it cost him in his life. Once he found out and was convinced that, that God had chosen Jesus to be the Messiah, he went into Arabia, then he came back to Damascus, and three years later he went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with the leading apostles there, and wouldn't be accepted except Barnabas brought him in and, and helped him to be, become a part of the church there. 
After this, he became his, took, undertook his very famous meetings and mission, at least three mission journeys. He was working with the church in Antioch in Syria. The Holy Spirit said, separate me, Barnabas, uh, Paul and Barnabas, for the work which I have appointed them to do. Beginning in Acts chapter 13, verse 2 and following, Paul made that missionary journey, the first one at least. And during the next 20 years or so, between the mid-30s and the mid-50s, after a, that is A.D., he established several churches in Asia Minor and also in Europe. Actually, he was the instrument by which the church was started, but it was the Lord and the gospel which did it. No person, somebody talks about, I, I converted somebody. No, you didn't. You may preach the words, you may teach them, you may plead with them and pray with them, but if the word doesn't convert them, they're not converted. They'd have converted to you maybe, but not the truth. And so when you look at what Paul did, he, was, was, he made these journeys and often, we're going to notice in a minute, often this brought him a lot of persecution and a lot of hatred. But while on the island of Paphos on the first missionary journey, we find the name mentioned Paul instead of Saul. And this would be the way that he would be known from now on as Paul, not Saul. Saul was a common name among the Jewish society. Remember Paul was of the tribe of Benjamin? You remember the most famous Benjamite in the scriptures? King Saul, the first king of Israel. So this was a common name. And so as you look at this, this was, was the name that he was born with, and yet he's now known as Paul. Why? Most likely because he was from now on to be the special apostle to the Gentiles. And because from now on he was going to do this, uh, this, this was going to be, since he had a, and this, we'll notice in a minute, this is a Greek name. So Burton Kaufman puts it this way. It also does not mean that the name Paul was here given for the first time. But that he'd always had it. Paul was the Gentile form of the Greek name, Greek form of the word Saul. And Saul was here beginning his great work among the Gentiles. So it was appropriate that the Gentile form of his name would be used henceforth. So now he's going to be known as, as Paul. And that's the way we start our lesson. Not Saul, but Paul. And so as you think about it, this is important. But one of the problems Paul faced... There were a lot of false teachers, just like there are today, who would not accept the truth but wanted to change what was the doctrine that was being taught. Some denied the resurrection altogether. Some said the resurrection is already passed. But by and large, the biggest problem that Paul faced in all of his preaching and in the churches was what we call Judaizing teachers. These were Pharisees and others of their like who said, yes, you need to be baptized for the mission of your sins. You need to become a Christian. But the men also all need to be circumcised, and you need to keep the law of Moses. This created a great conflict, because the old law had been nailed to the cross, Colossians 2.14, and taken out of the way. And so the new Christ way, the church, was now to be God's way of dealing with his people. But these Judaizing teachers wouldn't give up on that. They just kept on and on and on, insisting that you had to do this as well. And Paul fought it, and he and Barnabas fought it tooth and nail everywhere they went. And finally, they decided they would go to Jerusalem, to the mother church, if you will, the first congregation of the Lord's church, and where many of the leaders and others and elders were, were there. And so they went. It's recorded in Acts chapter 15. You ought to read that sometime. It's a very interesting thing. But the conclusion of the meeting was that these things were not going to be bound on the Gentiles. They would not be required to keep the law. The men would not be required to be circumcised. And from then on, this letter was written that the church needed to be delivered to, to all the congregations that they traveled to. But it still didn't stop the problem. There was still a problem with this over the years. But basically, this was the, the major form of false doctrine they had to receive. And so this was one of the major hurdles that had to be dealt with. That, that old law was dead and it was passing away and God didn't want them to be worshiping under that law anymore or serving him under that law anymore because Christ had come and died on the cross to make a new way, to purchase the way of salvation for all men and to add them to his church, his body so that they would serve and, and worship him from then on. Paul had another problem, though. Everywhere he went preaching the truth, they were unable, basically, as I said, to found his doctrine or, or to prove him wrong. So what happened, as usual, and how less than usual, it happens an awful lot of the time. 
When somebody can't refute the message, they want to shoot the messenger. And so these Jews, wherever Paul went, and you read about this beginning in Acts chapter 13, wherever he would go into a city, he would go to the synagogue. That was usually the first place he went. And he would preach uh, to them Jesus and the resurrection. And many people would believe it. And the problem was that there were many Jews who didn't believe it, and they would be jealous and angry and upset that Paul was gaining all this, all this acclaim. And so they began to persecute him everywhere that they possibly could. In each city he entered, he was opposed by the Jews who hated him and, and his doctrine. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 22 through 33, he gives us a kind of a background or, or some of the details of his suffering. It goes like this. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they of the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. Now listen to this. I am more in labors, more abundant, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prison, prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen. Notice that. In perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the woods, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. In weariness and toil and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other thing that comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Who's weak and I'm not weak? Who's made a stumble and I do not burn with indignation? So if I must boast, I boast in the things which confirm my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I'm not lying. One of the accusations made against Paul was that this was not true. In Damascus, back to early in his life, the governor under Redis the king was guarding the city of the Damascenes with the garrison designed to arrest me, but I was let down in a basket through a window ball and escaped from his head. Did he, can you imagine at what point, if you were doing what Paul was doing, would you have said enough is enough? Enough's enough. I can't take this anymore and quit. Paul didn't. Paul didn't. It's going to cost him. We're going to find out why. In the late 50s, Paul had been going around to the congregations. There was a famine in Jerusalem. And the congregations throughout Asia and some in Europe had contributed some money or made up a contribution to help relieve the affliction of the church in Jerusalem, which is a, is a wonderful thing. As that money was brought back to the church in Jerusalem, Paul was one of the ones who brought it along with, with some Gentile converts who, who were from the other congregations. There he was arrested, being falsely accused of bringing a Gentile into the temple. Now think for a moment, this, this is Judaism. The temple is the most sacred place on earth to the Jew. No Gentile could enter anywhere into the temple, maybe even into the outer court possibly, if he was, was a proselyte. So they are jumping to conclusions that Paul has brought a Gentile into the temple and polluted it. False accusations. But from then on, there was a series of trials among the Jews, among the Romans, before King Agrippa, and finally he ends up in Rome. You read about that in Acts chapter 24, verse 28. Paul had always wanted to go to Rome. He prayed that he might be able to go there. He thought in his own mind that he would, would pass by some of the congregations and they'd help him financially. He'd be able to travel to Rome and, and share some message with them as well. But he did go to Rome, but not the way he thought. He was a prisoner, bound and with a centurion taking charge to take him there. But he ended up in Rome. And we think about that. But he was probably released from his first imprisonment, most far as we can tell. He was apparently returned to Rome as a prisoner later, but Philippians chapter 1, verse 19, you can read this for yourself, that he would be freed from his first imprisonment. And he apparently was. Went about doing some other work for the church and maybe some other missionary work that we don't know about. Some people suggested that he went into Europe and others. He read all sorts of things. But eventually, 
he was brought back to Rome. This time, if you read 2 Timothy, he understood he was not going to be free. He said, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight, I've kept the faith, I've finished my course. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the God, the righteous judge, will give me on that day at his appearing, and not to me only, but also to all those who love his appearing. He knew he wasn't going to make it this time. If you read First Clement, who is an early writer, but not inspired, he seems to indicate that, that Paul was killed, beheaded in Rome, and probably under Nero because of the great persecution that Nero brought about, because he set the city on Rome on fire, but blamed it on the Christians. Paul's the inspired author of a major part of the New Testament. Nobody else has written as much in the Holy Scriptures by inspiration as Paul did. Thirteen books for certain were either written by him or dictated by him. One of the accusations or against the Scriptures is that Paul didn't write all those letters. Somebody else actually wrote them. Well, that's true. But many of them weren't written by Paul's own personal hand. But he dictated by the Holy Spirit and through the Holy Spirit every word in every one of those books. And if he wrote the book of Hebrews, it would be 14 out of the New Testament, out of the 27 books that he did write. His thoughts were original, coming from God through the Holy Spirit to the Apostle Paul to the hands of those who actually did the writing. And some of those he wrote himself. But he would dictate a lot of them. What a devoted determined and faithful servant of the Lord. What a man. Not just a human man. What a Christian. What a faithful warrior, soldier for the cause of Christ. I don't believe anybody else from a totally human hand standpoint has, has the, the, the possibility of even beginning to touch the hem of his garment as far as standing for the cross, fighting for the truth, being un, unmovable, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's all interesting. But what can we learn? I mean, this, this is history. We can appreciate this. But it, are there some things that you and I can learn that hopefully will help us and strengthen us? Well, first and foremost, Paul served as a good example. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, he said, Imitate me just as I also do Christ. Imitate me just as I also do Christ. Paul didn't say, do what I do or do what I say. He said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. 1 Peter 2, 21, Peter says that Jesus left us an example that we should walk or follow in his steps. Yes, Paul was a great example. And many people of his day and many of his contemporaries profited from that example. But what's that to do with you and with me? Friends, we live in a troubled world. We live in an evil, evil and sinful world. We live in a time when even the church is trying to, men are trying to remake the church into a denomination. What can I do? What can you do? We can stand for the truth, just like Paul did. We can take a stand on what's right. We don't have to go around and, you know, make a big loud proclaiming, but, but, but we need every opportunity we have to say, this is truth and this is right and this is where I'm going to take my stand. In our families, in the church, in our workplace, in schools, in society around us, every time we face a situation that comes up, we need to let people know, I am a Christian, I stand with the Lord, I stand for truth. What we do and what we say is, is really important. In the world around us, there, there's so few of us that do this, this real standing for Christ and, and, and making a witness for Christ. We need to make sure we do that. And to do that, we need to control our emotions. We need to make sure that we don't lose our temper and get angry and upset. We need to be an example. Paul spoke of himself as an ambassador for Christ. That's what you and I are to do. God has no hands. Christ has no hands but our hands. He has no feet but our feet. He has no tongue but our tongue. To proclaim the message to a lost and dying world. You don't have to stand on a soapbox and preach. But you can do it little by little every opportunity you have as, as you face and talk to people. Lord Jesus is the Son of God. 
You can say that. We need to be sure we're proclaiming the word of Christ. But Paul was not sinless. To make sure we understand that, Paul was human just like you and just like me. And he had his moments, he had his days. We don't have time to read this, but sometime read chapter 7 of the book of Romans, beginning in verse 14. Paul basically said this. The things that I want to do at right that are right, I can't. And the things that I don't want to do that are wrong, I do. And then he says, it is sin in me that causes that. Folks, we're all sinners. We're all sinners. Some are unsaved sinners and some are saved sinners. We make mistakes. We stumble and fall. We do things sometimes and say things. Or we don't do things and we don't say things. We, we stumble and fall. We make mistakes. Not willfully. Not because we choose to. But because we're weak. But we walk in the light, 1 John 1, 7. As He is in the light. The blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses us from all sin. Let's remember that as we live. Paul gave all that he had to do what was right. Not wishy-washy, uh, not hesitant, not lukewarm, not indifferent. He gave everything that he had to what was right. His love for the, the Lord, for what he did for him and for God his Father was a supreme factor in his life. 1 John 4, 19 says we love him, speaking of God, because he first loved us. Paul's motivation was love for Christ because, and if you read what we heard, the scriptures, we, had, we understand that, that this is what motivated him. When Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment in Matthew 22, 37? He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind. Not part of it. And you and I, as we live our lives, needs to be the deciding factor, the motivating factor, the part of us that, that causes us or enables us to do all that we do for Christ because we love Him so much because of what He did for us. Have you, do you ever stop and think sometimes? Just open your mind and think about the cross, what it meant, what it cost, what was involved in it. Folks, if that's not love, there is nothing else that is. And God sent Him for you. He sent Him for me. He sent Him to die, take my sins and your sins. He had none of His own. Paul had an extensive knowledge of the Scriptures. 2 Timothy 2.15 Be diligent to sow yourself approved unto God a work that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Paul's knowledge of the Scriptures enabled him to be successful in what he did. You and I need to know more of the Scriptures. We need to make it a part of our lives. We need to look into those Scriptures and, and focus on those Scriptures and learn them and, and meditate on them and keep doing it over and over and over again. Repetition is good for us in our learning. He was willing to suffer the loss of everything for the cause of Christ. You read about that in Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to just pass over that. You know what he said. Whatever is good for me, I gave it all up because of Christ and His righteousness. Folks, He understood being saved by grace, not by works. Saved by grace. God's grace is unmerited favor. God's grace is extending to us the hope of pardon, the chance of salvation, the place in heaven that we don't deserve, that we aren't entitled to. We were unlovable, undeserving, unworthy, sinners and enemies of His. But He gave us His grace by sending His Son. Ephesians chapter 2, we are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. We're saved by grace through faith. His faith enabled Him to, under, to, with, to withstand every attack that Satan could muster. Oh, you're going to be tempted, you already have. We all are. But you know what the beautiful promise is in 1 Corinthians 10, 13? God is faithful. God is faithful who will not allow us to be tempted above what we are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. Satan can't make you do anything. All he can do is make you want to do it. And James says if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. Draw near to God and He'll draw near to you. We face temptation just like Paul did. I'm sure there are many days, though it's not recorded for us, 
he felt so discouraged and defeated and depressed, but he kept on to lose victorious. But now what about you tonight? What about you tonight? If you're, if you're watching us online, I want to ask you about your soul tonight. I want to ask you about where you are in your relationship to God. Are you a warrior for Christ? Or are you just one who's standing in the shadows? Have you put on Christ in baptism? Maybe you're here tonight in, in this assembly and you need to become a Christian. Why would you waste an opportunity like this? Why would you leave this building? Or, or if you're watching us online, why would you not text this number or call this number and leave a voicemail message and tell us, I want to become a Christian. I want to talk to someone. I want to meet with someone. And we'll meet you there, here. We'll, we'll talk with you and reason with you. And if you need to become a Christian, we'll, we'll baptize you into Christ. But probably far and away more tonight than maybe some of us who become lukewarm. Casual and different in our service to the Lord. Uh, we still think of ourselves as being faithful, but, but we really don't really invoke or involve ourselves in the full service or all that can be involved in being a Christian. If that's your case tonight, you also call us number. And if you're here tonight, we're going to sing a song in just a minute. This is not my invitation. It's not the elders' invitation. It's not Keith's invitation. It's not FH's invitation. It's not Paul Phil's invitation. The Lord, if you can picture this, is standing here with, with arms outstretched and said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Lord wants you to come to Him. If you need to become a Christian, we'll help you do that. If you need to rededicate your life, if you need prayers, if, if you need prayers for strength or, or whatever your need is, we want to help you. But we can only do that if you let us know what you need. And the only way to do that is meet us down front. Please don't be ashamed or afraid to walk down this aisle. Everybody in this building loves you. If you make your life right, we'll surround you and love you and hug you, even if we have to do that with a mask on. If you're subject to the invitation of our Lord tonight in any way, would you please come and do it right now while we're standing singing? But lost has thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson flood, cleansed and made holy, humble and holy, right in the sight of God. Hast thou dominion or self and or sin? Has thy heart right with God? Over all evil without and within, Has thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson flood, Cleansed and made holy, Closing song is number 40, after to be led in dismissal prayer. 86 present this evening. Good to see everyone here on this Wednesday evening. Looking forward to seeing you again Sunday morning. Number 40, sing the first verse before we're dismissed. Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without thee. I dare not try to take one step alone I cannot bear the loss of life unaided I need thy strength to lead myself alone Would you
you bow with me, please? Our most holy Father in heaven, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you, Father, for the beauty that you've surrounded us with, for the opportunity that we have to come together and to study your word. We pray, Father, you'll be with the leaders of this nation, give them wisdom. Father, we also pray you'll be with the leaders of this congregation, bless them. Father, help us to be better examples to others as we go on from day to day and keep us safe. Help us, Father, to be stronger and more faithful in your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.